of this training in coaching with Deborah Keo, lesson four, designing your training strategy. Today we'll be completing lesson four, designing your training strategy with Deborah Keo. All right, let's jump right into it. This step in the process, remember this is a series of process videos, really is the no chart step. Um, I almost didn't include this. And if you remember in both the last two lessons, I've said, you know, these steps uh, three, four, and five, two, three, four are interchangeable, meaning you kind of do them all at the same time. And I am explaining some process. Each process for me, uh, you know, obviously uses a fair amount of data. But here's the point where I use all of my diagnostic data from the testing, the results, the, the metrics, and all the things we've been talking about. This step, I'm using that data, but I'm using it to think. And that means that, you know, for me, one of the things I want people to think about is analytics or data is knowledge. Knowledge supports the decisions, meaning it's not the solution. You're not going to go out and do these couple of tests and be like, oh, I know exactly what to do. You have to apply that information and knowledge and make it work for you. And I think it's important in this stage because people get into data training and they're like, wow, there's a magic solution here. And they just act on that data. Slowing down to think is probably a pretty important step. <coughs> okay, let's talk about this. There's a lot of stuff on the page, and actually I'm gonna do this. <laughs> this is way more light than I would normally do it, but I just wanna show the demo. The reality is, right, if you remember in lesson two, I showed you my data anal analysis cycle, how I sort of end going through the diagnosis phase. And here's what I'm doing. So remember at the core, we have the external factors, which are general demands of the events. We have the external factors of specific demands of the event. Internally, as we begin to look at the rider, we have the rider's ability, strength, and limiters. And as I said, even though there's no chart for it, even though as we begin to use all the subjective data, which I think is really exciting, we get a better focus on the psychological focus and motivation of the athlete. So let's just say I just got back from England doing a uh, USA team camp with one of my athletes and, uh, you know, a big 20K time trial. I got to see actually see one. It was great to watch. Um, use that as an example here. So if you just picked, and everybody, whenever I do examples, there's nothing specific here. I try to keep it very general over here all day. Um, simple 20 kilometer TT, a rolling course with one solid climb. It rolls through two towns and it might be very hot out. So when I start at the general demands, I'm starting very general. I'm looking online as I showed you, finding profiles, course information, maps, power files, but also don't forget to do things like check the weather and temps and prevailing winds and humidity, all those things that can affect you, put them there in your general terms. Over on the specific, let's say, well, wow, it's a pretty technical star area. You know, um, it's, it's pavers or cobblestones or tricky little wet twist or whatever it might be. That first climb comes at 5.5 kilometers in, it's 1.8 kilometers long, and it's a 7% grade. You know, when I would even drill deeper in specific demands, I'm often very, when I'm looking at climbs, the average grade rarely tells you the truth. You might have profiles, you know, in your information. You might be thinking about it's one climb with three steps. Each little step is unique. However floats your boat. But here's where you do want to be specific. Drill down and deep. Maybe both the towns have some road furniture and that really is going to be important that they handle. Um, maybe environmentally there's high winds and, and you're going to have to think about handling in the towns versus handling out in the fields. Things like that. Get specific here. You know, and one of the examples I have here is this athlete, Joe or Jane Ryder, their number one competitor is going to be here, right? That's a specific demand. If somebody you need and have to beat is here, you might have to ride a race a little different or, or in a time trial, it's probably not that much different. You're still racing yourself, but I think you get my point. Then we move around to the internal factors. What does this rider have? Well, they have a strong FTP. Okay, that's good. That's going to generate a fair amount of watts. Maybe they are a good bike handler in the bar, so they can be aero and handle their bike. But what about as a limiter, if this has a low athlete has a low FRC and really needs to pace that climb? You know, a lot of time trialers, as we know, probably won't have that much anaerobic capability. But understanding that athlete's aerobic capacity is a a limiter and understanding exactly where that limiter is can have some pretty big effects on what I'm willing to do to pace that climb with an athlete and therefore the way I should train it. I might make a decision where, man, that FRC is too much of a limiter 
Remember, a limiter is a weakness that causes you to lose. Therefore, in the 12, 8, 20 weeks leading up, whatever your choice is, you're working on that FRC. You're saying, I've got to get them up that hill a little bit faster. That might be a choice you make. You might say, no, nope, their threshold's big enough. We're going to focus on the pacing and maybe spending the same time building those thresholds, building that threshold. And finally, you have the psychological focus. Strong mindset, their main competitors here, that really fires them up, right? Take this as the lesson, right? The process of actually going through this exercise and writing it down becomes important. What I think people miss a lot is they jump into data and they see charts and whatever, and then they actually do all the planning, diagnostic, analytics, analysis in their head. And that leads you to just jump to certain conclusions. Sometimes, remember my first slide, go slower, right? Think it out. Think first and then act. So slowing down and just writing it all out. This is the same notes. This is actually a sheet I use. I just use a Google Doc and I just have a little four blocks and I write all my notes. And as a matter of fact, from the moment I start diagnosing data, I'm doing that. And then I usually take things out to my final copy. I get too much stuff in as I'm thinking. And then when I go back and analyze it, I've got so many notes. It's often like, no, we really don't need to focus on that. No, we don't really need to. So what I'm left with is the core. So part of this phase, like I said, this is the no chart phase, right? Is really just giving you get a cup of coffee, designate a half an hour of uninterrupted time, and just take analytics into the thinking, take analytics into the art. Analytics will improve your decision-making process. It won't make them for you. And it's you still have to go through the process at times. And this is the process of planning your training strategy. All right. Once you've got that together, right, now you need to look at the actual numbers. Now we get into data. And again, this is where, why you wanted to test early and have the athlete's power duration curve and have the athlete's, you know, data numbers at different time ranges. And if you didn't have them at the time range, you have an excellent estimate in the power duration curve. What I do is a gap assessment. So once I've really broken down the course, let's say our 20 kilometer TT, I'm going to say, well, this athlete is roughly a 2.3 uh, CDA, and right now they're at, well, let's use this example, 255 watts, right? Well, man, that's not going to be enough to win. I know to get that athlete to win, we got to have them around 300 watts at threshold. Well, so I have a, what do we have column? So in this example, 255 watts. What do we need? 300 watts. But I also have a target column because sometimes, and I bet you most coaches have run into this, you have a scenario where the, the, the need is higher than you think you can actually deliver. Maybe that gap, right, is so big. So this analysis process and doing a gap assessment with your athlete can oftentimes ground them in the appropriate expectations. Because I don't know if I could take an athlete in 20 weeks and take their threshold from 255 to 300 unless they're just getting off the couch. So you might have a slightly different target. Now we, uh, we want to look at that one minute power, you know, part of that climb and really they need to punch the early part of the climb. Well, maybe they have 655 watts now. They have 700. We're going to need 700 watts. We have to go up that hill really hard. Bad example for a time trial, just making the example. Um, well, I think this athlete could do that. So let's target the 700 watts. But also don't just keep your gap assessment about power. Maybe this person wants to be the national champ and they can only train 10 hours. You're like, man, we need at least 12, right? That should be part of your thinking. If you have your needs analysis from the page uh, before, that training environment, training time, those are external factors that probably should be on your list, right? And if they don't have it, this gap assessment here will really help you think out all the things. And really what you're doing is saying, here's what I have, or here's what the athlete has. Here's what we need to accomplish the goal. And then do I need a slightly different target because I don't think we could achieve that. You know, in my example, I put here, the athlete has 10, we need 12. I'm going to challenge them 12, right? And if we don't get it, I'll change it to 10 and it is what it is. And what I mean by challenge is say, hey, Joe Ryder, can you give me 12 hours a week? I think when you go through all your, th if you've gone through the needs assessment, the little, you know, this page, well, these will just come out. They'll emerge to the top, the things that you should be looking at in that gap assessment. And if you think about it, what you end up with at this point so far, and I have one more step, is you've done an excellent diagnostic. You summarized it into a needs assessment. Now you've broken that down into more measurable metrics, right? More measurable points. And you've done a good analysis of what does the athlete have? What do they need? And what should we target to be realistic? 
Well, the next step of that is understanding that as you move down that, that trail, that road, is that you have certain limitations on what you're generally gonna train in an athlete short and long term. I borrowed the slide from Dr. Andy Coggin, um, and it's looking at some of the improvement areas we have that we can build on in a season. So if you look at things like VO2 max, right, as an example, let's just start with that one. Short-term training, you can improve VO2 max 15 to 25%. You really can move it. I know people love to say VO2 max is genetic. You can't move it, but we're all getting smarter than that. VO2 max can move a lot. The peak, the absolute cap is probably genetic. And in long-term training, you maybe can get an additional 10%. Um, lactate threshold though, you can move that 30 to 45% in short-term training and an additional 20 to 30%. That's why oftentimes, in this case, it just happens to work for a time trial, right? <laughs> a time trial list. Um, focusing on threshold is typically the biggest bang for the buck, unless the event specificity is highly specific, highly, highly specific to something else. Because part of it is you can improve threshold the best. So putting that focus there, you can get some of the best results. Then you talk about efficiency, neuromuscular power, anaerobic capacity. What's the range? I could have shown this slide before the gap assessment, um, but then the sense is it gets a little confusing if you think, well, why showing these? And then I show you the gap. So if you look at the, you're building your gap assessment and having some understanding of what people can do you, or what the physiology maybe will allow you to do, you have a good ability to just kind of lay that out and, and think them through. All right, now that I have my gap assessment, I know that I'm within the realms of what's possible. Then I go on, I'm an old school teacher. Um, I build rubrics, which is a system of thinking about the way you're gonna achieve the goals, the milestones, the things you've set out. So let's say this athlete has a goal. They wanna win three time trials, three of the 20Ks or three provincial time trials, you know, whatever your nation and, and, and area are putting on. And they wanna do that by building their threshold to 300 watts. Remember our gap assessment, we already had a number, right? So we put a number to the goal. What are the milestones going from 255 to 300? You know, I know I said the goal or the, the target was 285, but I'm still gonna drive for the goal. I just want the athlete not to be disappointed. If they achieve, if they go from 255 to 285, that's really good, but we're still gonna drive for that bigger goal. So what I'm doing is once I have the goal, which is win by increasing threshold to 300 watts, right? If we simplify it, I'm building certain milestones that hold both me and the coach um, accountable to the training strategy we're about to design. And that is, you know, and I'm making these up, 275 by February 1, 285 by March 1, 300 by April 15. Then I say, well, gee, what are the key activities? What are the key things we have to do to hit those milestones? Well, we got to complete three FTP workouts per week. And FTP doesn't mean you're always at FTP. A sweet spot is a great way to get there. A uh, bunch of ways to do it. Um, and you need to progress your tempo workouts to you're capable to do two hours of tempo. Maybe the athlete needs better fatigue resistance to hold that, um, those power targets and hit those numbers. The next goal, yeah, it's got to climb on it. I didn't talk about weight, right? In my example, another thing that should always be thought about in your needs assessment, this athlete might be a little heavy, so they're going to target losing some weight. That will improve their watts per kilogram for the climb. Will actually also improve their relative VO2 max and typically will result in a threshold increase as long as you're not cutting weight and losing power or negatively affecting your training. So we have some milestones just the same. It's not always a power number, right? But there it's dates and targets that we have. And then I just, what are the activities we're going to do to deliver that milestone strategy and follow a 12 week training plan um, and do at least three fat burning rides a week during base period. Um, the, and I'm not a big believer in fat burning rides. I just use this as an example, unless you're a professional athlete and know how to do it. But that being said, so now we have rubric. So once you've done your needs analysis and gap assessment, you usually can take that into three or four rubrics. Now is really when you start creating your training strategy. Step one at this phase, I review my rubrics with my athlete and I make sure we agree. They're willing to do the work. I've had to get the feedback from them as I'm building it, right? And what I find is if you keep the athlete involved in the steps of creating a strategy, notice I didn't say creating the training plan. A plan is something different. A plan is the implementation of your strategy. How do you expect to execute, right? So many times we plan without strategy. 
my training strategy system I just showed you gives you the ability to assess, diagnose, create a needs analysis, take that needs analysis into a gap assessment, then use the needs analysis and gap assessment to develop a couple of key rubrics. How are we, coach and athlete, going to achieve these goals? And do we both commit to these milestones and activities? That'll help you either, if you're a self-coached athlete, it helps you be more self-accountable, but better yet, in the coach-athlete relationship, it makes both the coach more accountable to the athlete and the athlete more accountable to their goals. So it really is a strong process. Now, once you get into that, then you draw, you build your training plan by you know taking these rubrics and it should drive all of your training plan implementation because now you have key goals, key milestone dates you expect to achieve performance. You have a deep understanding of the athlete. You know, you've used their historical data. You have a clean set of tests so you know their starting point. Now you build the training plan. I'm not going to go to the training planning in this session. There is a webinar that I will link. I did in WK4 about building the annual plan. That one is about an hour and 15 minutes long, and that's why I'm not including it here. I just want to give you an overview of the strategy. Thanks. And the next lesson, we will go back to using charts and, uh, and data heavily as we talk about building smart workouts.